All right, continuing on on page 136. I remembered how he used to teach this idea in the group process class back at Brandeis. I had scuffed back then, thinking this was hardly a lesson plan for a university course. Learning to pay attention, how important could that be? I now know it is more important than almost everything they taught us in college. More emotion for my hands, and as I gave it to him, I felt a surge of guilt. Here was a man who, if he wanted, could spend every waking moment in self-pity, feeling his body for decay, counting his breath. So many people with far smaller problems are so self-absorbed. Their eyes glaze over if you, if you speak to them for more than 30 seconds. They already have something else in their mind. A friend to call, a fax to send, a lover they're daydreaming about. They only snap back to full attention when you finish talking, at which point they say, uh-huh, or, yeah, really. And they're fake, and they fake their way back to the moment. Part of the problem, Mitch, is that everyone is in such a hurry. Maury said, especially these days, I think. People haven't found meaning in their lives, so they're running all the time looking for it. They think the next car, the next house, the next job, then they'll find those things are empty, too, and they just keep running and running. Once you start running, I said, it's hard to slow yourself down. It's not so hard, he said, shaking his head. Do you know what I do? When someone wants to get ahead of me in traffic, when I used to be able to drive, I would raise my hand. He tried to do this now, but the hand just lifted weakly, only like about six inches. I would raise my hand as if I was going to make a negative gesture, and then I would wave and smile instead of giving him the finger. You let them go, and you just smile. I mean, you know what? A lot of times they smiled back. The truth is, I don't have to be in that much of a hurry with my car. I would rather put my energies into uh, people. He did this better than anyone I've ever known. Those who sat with him saw his eyes go moist when they spoke about something horrible or crinkle into light when they told him a really bad joke. He was always ready to openly display the emotions so often missing from the baby boomer generation. We are great at small talk. What do you do? Where do you live? But really listening to someone without trying to sell them on something, pick them up, recruit them, or get some kind of status in return... How often do we get to do this anymore? I believe many visitors in the last few months of Maury's life were drawn not because of the attention they wanted to pay him, but because of the attention he paid to them. Despite his personal pain and decay, this little old man listened the way he, they always wanted someone to listen. I told him he was the father everyone wishes that they had. I guess Mitch's father, like, really hates reading this book. Well, he said, closing his eyes, I have some experience in that area. The last time Maury saw his own father was in the city morgue. Charlie Schwartz was a quiet man who liked to read his newspaper alone under a street lamp on Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. Every night when Maury was little, Charlie would go for a walk after dinner. He was a small Russian man with a ruddy complexion and a full head of grayish hair. Maury and his brother David would look out the window and see him leaning against the lamppost. And Maury wished he would come inside and talk to them, but he rarely did. Nor did he tuck them in, nor did he kiss them goodnight. Maury always swore he would do these things for his own children if he ever had any, and years later, when he had them, he did. Meanwhile, as Maury raised his own children... Charlotte was still living in the Bronx. He still took that walk. He still read that paper. One night, he went outside after dinner. Oh, it's not Charlotte. Charlie was still living in the Bronx. I just got really confused. One night, he went outside after dinner, a few blocks from home. And he was accosted by two robbers. Give us your money. One said, pulling a gun. Frightened, Charlie threw down his wallet and he began to run. He ran through the streets and he kept running until he reached the steps of a relative's house where he collapsed on the porch. He died of a heart attack. He died. Maury was called to identify the body. He flew down to New York and went to the morgue. He was taken downstairs to the cold room where the corpse was kept. 
This is your father, the attendant said. Maury looked at the body behind the glass, the body of the man who had scolded him and molded him and taught him to work, who had been quiet when Maury wanted to speak, who had told Maury to swallow his memories of his mother's when he wanted to share them with the world. He nodded and then he walked away. The horror of that room, he would later say, sucked all other functions out of him. He did not cry until days later. Still, his father's death helped prepare Maury for his own. This much he knew. There would be lots of holding and kissing and talking and laughter and no goodbyes left unsaid. All the things he missed with his father and his mother. When the final moment came, Maury wanted his loved ones around him, knowing what was happening. No one would get a phone call or a telegram or have to look through a glass window in some cold and foreign basement. Oh. In South America... In the rainforest, there's a tribe called the Descani. You see the world as a fixed quantity of energy that flows between all creatures. Every birth must therefore engender a death, and every death bring forth another birth. This way, the energy of the world remains complete. When they hunt for food, the Descani know the animal, that the animals they kill will leave a hole in the spiritual well. But that hole will be filled, they believe, by the souls of the Dasani hunters when they die. Were there no men dying? Oh, were there no men dying, there would be no birds or fishing or fish being born. I like this idea. Mori likes it too. The closer he gets to goodbye, the more he seems to feel we are all creations in the same forest. What we take, we must replenish. It's only fair, he says. All right, I'm stopping there, and then we'll continue with the next Tuesday in a couple minutes.